Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be. And welcome to this session on AI for Business, brought to you by Great Learning, Power Ahead. In this session, what we will talk about is in two steps, two parts to the presentation. The first part, I want to talk about new technologies, technologies associated with AI, artificial intelligence that is, with machine learning, with data and allied areas, and what difference they are making in our lives. In the second part of the presentation, I'll talk about new skills and how they can be developed and what learners are learning in our programs and across the world. My name is Abhinanda Sarkar. I serve as faculty for Great Learning, teaching a variety of programs including AI, machine learning, and data science. So let's get on with it. Let me set a context first. And this is a context that many of you are familiar with. And it is a context that's built around two ideas that are very central to the technology world today. I will bring it down to business very soon. One of them is big data and the other is deep learning. What are these two technologies about and why are they suddenly in the picture? Big data is the story of large volumes of data coming at us at high velocities over the internet over various kinds of sources. For example, data from social media, which is in the form of text and discussion and pictures, etc. Data from sensors and the so-called Internet of Things or IoT. Coming from equipment, we'll talk a little bit about that in forthcoming discussions. And this data therefore is coming in a large amount of variety, not just spreadsheets, not just what business analysts have been familiar with for so long. Today, business data is not just about numbers. Business data is about images. It's about words. It's about people. It's about how we relate. And of course, it's a scary world. And it's a world that for which we have to be prepared with respect to its security implications and veracity. By that, what I mean is, is it true? Is it safe? Is it right? Concerns that all of us have in the business world and in society in general. The other side of the coin is deep learning. Now, learning here refers to what is known as machine learning. Machine learning is a set of techniques that are used that help process data on computers, getting learning and information from them. And we shall spend some time talking about machine learning. But what's deep about it? What is the depth that has recently come about? The depth that has come about is due to the ability to process language and vision. Make it look like what humans do. We see, we hear, we read. And so intelligence is characterized by these abilities as well. And so when computers have the ability to deal with things like language and vision, they begin to look intelligent. This is artificial intelligence. This is what we mean by artificial intelligence today. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. Since past the Second World War, there have been a series of innovations on understanding how the human brain works, about cognition, about thought, and about translating human behavior to computers. What has changed? What has changed 
is that the ability for computers to do things like language, vision, and human understanding has become vastly enhanced due to rapid advances in processing, like say, graphical processing units, which were designed to process pictures. But because pictures are complicated, GPUs can deal with many complicated things in addition to graphics or images. And of course, what we call supercomputers. Supercomputers, like Superman, have multiple capabilities associated with them, including the ability to store lots of data, ability to crunch numbers very, very quickly, do lots and lots of calculations. So these two worlds, the world of big data and the world of deep learning, have led to innovations in business and in society. But what kind of innovations are we going to be talking about? And what kind of innovations do upskilling programs now talk about? Let's take a deeper dive into what I mean by deep learning for language and vision. And no one is better at explaining that than the people who created it. This slide is from a paper from the journal Nature Reviews written by Lekun, Bengio, and Hinton, who are in some way the parents of deep learning as we understand it today. And let me run you through an example that they give, which explains why this is so powerful as a technique and why AI is making such a big difference. Imagine, if you will, a picture on the side of this kind, where there are people apparently selling vegetables. This picture has been input into a computer. The computer's job is to understand what this picture is of and then to be able to tell us. So to sort of read the picture, if you will, like a human, and then to communicate its content back to us like a human. And it does that using a series of techniques involving what are called neural networks. NN here stands for neural networks. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But for now, the idea is that there is a certain kind of neural network, a convolutional neural network, that helps understand what this picture is made of in different layers. Understanding the broad structure of the picture, saying, oh, there are things here, various kinds of units, entities here. Going deeper into what those entities are and trying to link that the entities to each other. Now, once I've broken down what this is, I need to translate it back into something that I can understand or tell the human. And I can use another kind of neural network, a recurrent neural network, for example, RNN, to generate the corresponding language associated with the ideas or the types of things that are in these images producing at the end text like this. A group of people shopping at an outdoor market. There are many vegetables at the fruit stand. This is something that we understand. But for the computer to make the journey from a set of pixels, which is what this is as far as the computer is concerned, to a string of letters and words which carry information to us, is a major innovation and a major step. And it is this innovation that is driving so much of a difference and making so much of a difference to business society and governance and our way of life. So just to continue a little further, the technology behind this, for example, it involves looking at pictures of this kind identifying various aspects of it, for example, maybe a frisbee or a dog or a giraffe and trees, and being able to go after various aspects of this image and then string it conceptually together into sentences like a little girl sitting on a bed with a teddy bear 
that means to understand girl teddy bear and bed this is what deep learning has done this capacity to extract information from images this capacity to work with language i should say at this point that all while the examples that have given have combined these two ideas applications don't need to they can simply focus on one or more of these ideas so now what we will do is sort of connect this technology to business to the world of various kinds of companies and how they are leveraging this kind of innovation and i want to take that journey in steps going from shall we say business intelligence which classically is the extraction of information from data like spreadsheets or dashboards going to machine learning these algorithms that i described mature versions of it like deep learning all the action leading to artificial intelligence i also want to cut this story into two slices static and dynamic by static what i mean is the analysis is being done in some sense in a one off kind of way and by dynamic what i mean is that the analysis is done continually and the intelligence is continually seeping in to the business to the managers and is being updated the way we see and update our intelligence like a child when it is growing up and developing new capabilities so let's walk through this, through this a little bit the simplest kinds of business examples might involve using broadly data in the sense of numbers in a static one off kind of setting for example businesses can build what are called scoring models a model is simply a reflection of reality it's you can think of it as an equation that says that if this happens then this happens and scoring means that i want to give a score to different things via a model for example i can score customers i can say tell me which customers will do something that's important to me for example purchase my product a propensity to buy as someone in marketing might say this is good some things are not so good for example the propensity to churn that is leave my business go to a competitor or stop using this technology so therefore there can be various kinds of models looking for positive outcomes negative outcomes default on loans for example is a classical application in finance these models are usually built based on data now this data comes through simple actions that a customer might make like an application for a loan for example or the purchase of a product or a response to a call but these things happen continually as well they're not static so when we move to these kinds of machine learning algorithms in a dynamic kind of setting then what happens then what happens is you regularly update your data data comes in streams shall we say and your model so to speak are refitted for new services new situations even for example situations of say fraud new kinds of fraud are being attempted by people who are up to no good how can i get data to do that if the fraud has not happened again listen and see continually is the easiest answer when it happens have the capacity to learn quickly and of course many of us are now seeing the consequences of disease so in a situation like we are in currently an epidemic things are not the same data is not the same business is not the same 
how can we adapt how can we make our data conform to the new situation and vice versa that is dynamic modeling and that kind of continual streaming and refitting of data is what modern machine learning tries to do so this is the story so to speak of numbers still the story of numbers but let me tie back to the fun things that i was talking about things like images and text and all of that and so when i now move to that kind of technology what do my static models become what do my scoring models become now these are not just numbers but in order to understand what the customer is going to do for example will they buy my product will they churn i can look at what they are doing for example in social media what are they saying do they like the product what is the sentiment this for example is what is known as sentiment analysis which is reading text and saying is this positive or is this negative does someone like the movie does someone like my restaurant or is there something i should worry about and prevent churn from happening i can do this with other kinds of data as well so for example i can look at video feeds i can look at images i can look for various kinds of threats and risks that might be happening and so all the analysis that i could do with data i can now do with pictures i can now do with text with voice and so this is very very powerful because what it means is that the notion of data has changed what it also means that traditionally the communities that work with data for example those who did statistics or those who work with databases now have very new skills available to them in order to be able to create new kinds of data streams if i continue the story to for example what happens in the dynamic world of ai when we are really learning things on the fly so to speak can i incorporate feedback can my learning be reinforced by what is going on is the company doing well is something bad happening to my customers should i then change what i'm doing or should i reinforce it reinforcement learning algorithms buttress this learning by getting a feedback associated with this and these feedbacks for example can form recommendation systems we all know this various kinds of recommendation systems you go online and see videos and videos are recommended to you you want to write an email and the email will suggest what might be the next word these are recommendation systems and they can be done with various interesting kinds of data leading to innovations such as chatbots where turing's old test there was something called the turing test where there still is the turing's test in a conversation can you tell whether the person you are conversing with is a human or a computer will it pass or fail the turing test well ask yourself do chatbots pass or fail the turing test so therefore new kinds of data continually being upgraded into business systems and what is that doing again to the world of business as i said it is leading to ways of communication it is leading to worlds in which recommendations in some way are changing the way we do business leading to various kinds of even new revenue streams such as advertising and so both on the positive shall we say growth side of business such as purchases and recommendations and the protective or defensive side of business like default disease fraud etc this kind of new information is leading to a variety of new opportunities opportunities in information technology opportunities in in shall we say digitization of various kinds of businesses and of course opportunities that are shall we say old school what do i mean by old school things that have been going on for a long long time for example manufacturing 
humans have been making things for millennia now. What difference is it making? What difference is artificial intelligence making to manufacturing? And what we can think of as manufacturing is of course two things. One is something is being manufactured. But the other is information about what is being manufactured and how. There is a passage of information, shall we say, from the customer to the process and a passage of product or service from the inputs back to the customer. A flow of information and a flow of material. And if you like words around such things, the flow of information can be thought of as analytics. In our organization, in great learning, there are analytics programs of great value and importance as well. Many of your learners begin that way. What is analytics? Analytics is the processing of this flow of information across the business chain to generate value. For example, in the manufacturing context, I can think of demand forecasting. Understanding how much I need to manufacture. Who will make it? The factory will make it. If too little is made, demand is not met. Too much is made, too much is spent and cannot be recovered by sales. So if I can get the right information and do this century's version of just-in-time manufacturing, I will be able to get both revenue optimization as well as cost optimization. And so the dashboards of the business intelligence age now become much more dynamic, intelligent, and cap capable of keeping up. Remember, all the new sources of data, all the social media, and all the various techniques, IoT, sensors come into play here. What about the other direction? The direction of the flow of material. Can we manufacture better? And for the purposes of this, this, this discussion, I call that robotics. Not in the sense of robots going this, that, or the other, but robots in the sense of automating things, including things that we may be familiar with, like 3D manufacturing or additive manufacturing, where a computer program can, from bottom to top, create a product if it knows what it's supposed to do by layering material on top of it. So these robots, so to speak, these manufacturing robots need to be told what to do, but they can also learn some things on their own with the data that they see and the reinforcement that they might get. And that will lead to a new generation of high quality products made efficiently and quickly. And the trade-off that many companies have with respect to cost and quality may not matter anymore. We'll just shift the goalposts on that. For developing countries, this is particularly important when we need to have custom products of high quality at low cost points. And so to be able to do this is an extraordinary value add. As I said, from things like 3D printing to improved quality control, we now have ways to change this kind of business and make it much broader in terms of customer connectivity and supply chain across lands, across countries, if need be. So this, in brief, is what the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning and data is about. Now, what does all of that mean for programs such as the programs Great Learning offers? What that means is new things need to be taught. What kinds of things can be taught? And what do our programs and programs across the world in this kind of technology talk about? Let me take the opportunity to explain that through some projects that our learners have done recently and through the programs that we have. Let me begin 
at a place where we often begin in our programs, data, the source of the information, the source of the learning. And so, for example, we teach how to capture unstructured data. In this example, from the AI ML program, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning program, we talk about handwriting digitization, about essentially looking at pixels, pixels are points in images, as you know, and converting these pixels into information such as numbers, slicing up this date into various regions, reading the pixels, so to speak, it's an image, and then translating it into a number, much like we translated the text, this will translate into numbers. What kind of technology is needed to do this? I'd already explained various kinds of machine learning imaging processes and also an understanding of, shall we say, handwriting and what handwriting is and a business context of what needs to be digitized. Another example, text itself and the visualization of text another AIML project that talks about saying, what do all these resumes talk about? What do this set of documents talk about? What are my emails all saying? I can't read all of them. Can you show me? Can you show me with words such that the words that show up often are larger? For example, how do I relate that to how humans perceive data? We perceive size with importance. And so therefore, larger things are more important. So our value system is being imposed on the data through an algorithm. This is old school visualization transported into the AI generation. And so being able to do this both in a data form and in a text form is what the AIML and such programs are very, very good at doing, providing both the mechanics of it as well as, as I said, the value proposition. So step one, data. What's step two? Step two is the learning algorithms themselves. And so the AIML program, again, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, Great Learning's postgraduate program, it's an 11 month program. It's a long program. You can think of it as a year long program. And we take the time to develop these ideas and these methods. They are not easy. For example, look at this. This is what a convolutional neural network actually looks like. And it's actually a fairly simple one with various kinds of data flows going into the data moving from layer to layer, so to speak. And in fact, the data doesn't even look like data at all. An image, so to speak, gets transformed into a block of data that the computer understands and we still cannot. So all these layers of data involving things like convolution, pooling, concatenation, etc., leading to the final act of a classification what is the diagnosis on this chest? Does this person have a respiratory disease or not? So at the end, this, the AML program, teaches a complicated journey, the journey from the data to the decision on which algorithm to take, to running it, and then translating back into a diagnosis or an application. Of course, we don't do this from scratch. That would mean an enormous amount of rebuild. So for example, very often our learners, what they do is they say, let me find out what's out there. Let me find out how someone else did this. This is the world of GitHub and Kaggle, collaborative learning, sandboxes for everyone. And many of you, I'm sure, play in these sandboxes. And so for example, you can see what someone has done and saying, what happened? How many samples did you use per batch? That's a complicated idea of batching out a process. 
And then what kind of performance did you get? How accurate was your algorithm? And what algorithm did you use to get this kind of accuracy? And then take these kinds of algorithms, for example, FaceNet is the one I'm talking about here, and use it in projects and ideas that make sense for a given engagement or a given data set. For example, this AML project talked about security. Using the identification of faces, for example, my face, is it a face? Number one, if it is a face, whose face? Is it my face? Safe to enter? Not safe to enter. Make a decision. We do not have to do these things from scratch. There is a community way of doing it in terms of the code, in terms of the data, and in terms of the algorithms. And our learners go through that journey over this year-long process that I described. However, at the end, this is a business proposition. It needs to generate value. Now, the value, of course, could be social value. For example, let's say finding out whether someone is COVID positive or not by using a chest image. It could be a personal value. For example, home security. Is my home under invasion? Can I see from video feeds that someone who should not be in my home is there? And this idea of being able to translate something into value is very important for our programs. And so therefore, getting the right kind of model and getting the right kind of users and value proposition is very important. This is not just about the technology. So what are the right models and what are they supposed to do? Work it backwards often. For example, you can say, what is my model supposed to do? Let's suppose you are trying to predict sports results. Let's say for a cricket game or a football game or a tournament. And say, what must we do? Must we do it game by game? Must we make predictions for players? And what do you want to get right? Is what kind of result, the result of the game, other things, etc. So therefore, various kinds of scores, precision scores, recall scores, test scores are built, which indicate what kind of value proposition is important. For example, if I'm looking at websites, is it important that all the relevant websites be shown to me? Or is it more important that what I see should be relevant to me? Give me all the useful information. Alternatively, whatever information you give me must be useful. These are value propositions. And our learners in the program learn this in a variety of ways through many, many projects that they do over the duration of the program. Now, as I said, all this takes time. But is there a way to short circuit the process? Is there a way to say, let me not take the time to build all these models, all the complicated structures of, say, a convolutional network, or all the various algorithms, such as gradient descent, etc. I am not so keen on that. Let's say, maybe you're advanced in your career, and you'd like to generate value in business directly, and perhaps you have teams who can build the technology and really enjoy the coding part. Maybe that's not you. If so, for example, then we have programs, for example, the AI for Leaders program or AIFL, which talks about generating value, social value and business value. There the projects look like, for example, getting the right users, identifying the right users, in this case for say insurance. What is the business model? Effectively make a business plan around this. Who will use it? Why will they use it? To build the system, what kind of data will I need from all these organizations? Do I need to have arrangements in place for that or agreements? How do I do this in some way in the real world? That is what the AIFL for Leaders program does. Without going too much into the nitty gritty of it, within the span of about four months, the program explains 
how you can take these technologies, we'll talk a little bit about implementation soon, and convert them into value and understand the different aspects of the value, the people aspects, the money aspects, the organizational design aspects, the strategy aspects. Hmm. How do I think about taking something to the customer? Do I know who the customer is or do I need a step to understand that? The way startups think, the way entrepreneurship inside large organizations happen. And this, quite obviously, you can imagine, is happening all over the world now as we retool ourselves to this world of big data and deep learning. And this is not a genie that can be put back in the bottle. We are, the data is released and will be released beyond our control very often. The algorithms are available for a variety of uses. And so now our objective is to convert that into value through business processes, both old and new, maybe newer business processes, maybe new ways of doing marketing, new digital marketing techniques are emerging, maybe new ways of doing manufacturing, as I said. And so new business models, as well as optimized versions of older business models. But you say, how can someone who is in the business world and taking, for example, the AIFL course, be able to implement all of this? Is this not too high tech? So here, let me talk a little bit about another innovation that is making things not low tech, but democratic, the cloud. What is the cloud? The cloud in current lingo is essentially a set of infrastructure in which various kinds of computing services are made available to people without necessarily knowing or opening up what those services are. They're like buying things off the shelf. So what does it mean, shall we say, to see AI off the shelf on the cloud? Remember the algorithms that I was talking about? the various kinds of texts and images and all of that, and the sophisticated neural networks? What if somebody built all those networks for you already and said, okay, why don't you give me your data and I will run that code for you and you see whether the results are valuable or not. Maybe I'll also give you the results. For example, this first graphic is from AWS, Amazon Comprehend is a text mining software where if you put in text, it will, for example, be able to generate the sentiments associated with that text. Remember I talked about sentiment analysis. So therefore, at a base level to run this kind of technology, you don't necessarily need to be an expert in human languages. You don't need to be a linguist. You don't need to be a language expert. You don't need to be a great computer programmer or a neural networks super engineer. But you do need to have the ability to say, this is the text I want and a provisioning of a service on the cloud to be able to run algorithms such as this. This is making a huge difference. Our AIFL program, for example, takes advantage of this technology to rapidly progress the technical side of the program so that you are good to go. And so what you can of course do is take this kind of technology and say, I will simply use it. You may be a little more adventurous and you may want to say that, but let's go back to these models. Let's go back here and say, I don't like these numbers. I don't like 64 samples or an alpha of 0.2. Can I fiddle with it? Can I get some insight into what this algorithm is doing? And there are services on the cloud that allow you to do that as well. For example, this is Microsoft's Azure Machine Learning Studio, which, and like a studio, it gives you more insight. It allows you to play with models. Now, each of these little boxes that you see are various parts of the model building exercise. And you don't need to know what is inside each black box 
but you can control the nature of the flow of data in models and play around with some numbers, a little bit unclear here, but these little toggles that you can use. And so that gives you a little more power. So now you can imagine where this technology is going. It's a continuum. And it's a continuum that begins from saying that if you really want to hack at this, if you really want to begin this from first principles, you can do that. And you can learn that from, you know, by learning and getting a lot of expertise in languages, for example, like Python. And the AIML program spends a considerable amount of time talking about Python and bringing you up to speed if that is the area where you want more development as a career skill. Or you may say that that is not where I want to go, but I want to be able to use these techniques. In which case, maybe not take the programming that seriously and still continue with the longer AML program and then look for the applications and do a super project with respect to all these technologies that are now available for you to do using machine learning, using methods and even older algorithms like, for example, regression. Hmm. Or you can say, I simply want the ability to deploy and tell people to deploy and use cloud techniques in AIML or also in the AIFL program, where, as I said, this is often used as a demonstrator and a shortcut so that we get to the business end and the leadership aspect of this quickly. And we can therefore run a shorter program. So therefore, whatever be the skill development need that you have, whether it is in the sense of coding, whether it is in the sense of learning newer algorithms, classical algorithms in statistics and database, newer algorithms in deep machine learning and deep learning and neural networks, or whether you're about the applications, the projects and the business value, increase sales, get a better market, reach out to customers, protect your business, protect the risk, identify the places where default is going to come from or where a fraud may happen. If that is what you're concerned with, do the project in both those programs. And that is where your major learning will be from. Whatever be the journey that you have in mind, programs such as these give you the upskilling abilities to come up to speed and fill in the gaps in your learning. We do not expect our learners to be expert coders, and we certainly do not expect them to be expert mathematicians or theoreticians in this field. We do not expect a nature review paper or a new deep learning algorithm to come out. If you want to do that, many of our learners have gone on to publish papers in respected avenues. That's your choice. But that is, you don't have to have that level. The cloud languages such as Python have democratized AI. It is now for many people, people like you and me, in all honesty, I am not trained as an engineer. I come from an old fashioned world, but this is such an exciting thing that I sort of have gotten myself engaged in it and now spend a lot of time working with it. And I've gone beyond my natural home of data. So therefore, what I want to do is stop here now. Hopefully I've taken you through a journey, a journey of what AI is about and why we should care and what the various widgets in it are to what we do about it. And the kind of journey that we offer to you through our various programs like AIML and AIFL. And there are various other obvious learning and community approaches available to you as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop briefly, see what questions you might have, and then continue this discussion going forward. And of course, I'm welcome to uh, uh, bring new points to the table. Let's see what you have. Questions are already coming in. So for example, one question, Prem asks, can a non-technical guy opt for this? The answer is yes, in the sense that there is obviously an interest and an experience in technology that is needed. 
if you're coming from a purely social science background, then that may mean a lot of work. But let's say that you are an engineer, mechanical engineering, civil, something in which technology is familiar to you, but maybe not coding, maybe not programming, maybe not information technology, then absolutely this is a space for you. Many of the people who are making great advancements are coming from a world that is technology, but not necessarily information technology. Remember, for example, the first email message or the early email messages came from physicists who simply wanted to share data. And the first internet came from just sharing particle physics data across organizations. It didn't come from computer technologists. So yes, if you have a passion for technology and a numerical background from the sciences or from engineering, then this is certainly something that you can do. If he asks, She's moving from doing architecture to here. That is a bigger shift. But once again, let's suppose in architecture, you're comfortable with computers, say computer-aided design. You can do a 3D graphic of, an, of a house or a living environment or a space. And you can connect it with various things. Let's say you can connect it with various aspects of cost of material. So you have the ability to work with computers and the ability to put various aspects of it together and you're willing to put in the effort to do this, then yes. Or as I said, if you don't want to do this and avoid the coding, there are shorter programs that say, let me not go into the details of a programming language like Python and simply know how to use this with familiarity on the cloud, for example, that also remains a possibility. I'd urge you to think about this. In other words, quantitatively literate, but not necessarily um, information technology. So please keep the questions coming and hopefully the questions will get to me. Technology is at play here. As you can see, I am reading. Uh, there's a question on different sets of data giving precise results. How are results, shall we say, guaranteed? This is important, quite obviously. Let's say that you're building a COVID test. You want that test to be correct, right? You want it to be accurate. If you have the disease, you want to know, be sure that you have the disease. And conversely, how are these things done? So there are basically two ways in which this is done. The first way on the data side is to ensure that you have the right data in place. To ensure that you have enough data in place. Remember, volume and variety. So is my data coming from all the users who could potentially be using my system? And is there enough of it so that in some way the law of averages cancels out errors and I will be able to get good results from the volume of data that I have? The more complicated the model, the more data it needs. Now, the second part of it is the algorithm itself and the cleverness associated with it. For example, continually training and retraining the model and comparing it with new test situations. For example, stress testing in banks or even regression testing or software testing uses this idea to say that, let me give it new data and see how well it does. And if it doesn't do very well, it says, mm -mm, haven't learned enough. And now can I do better? So measures such as these are continually tracked precision, recall, as I was giving test scores, and maybe they're not good. Maybe you'll say that something at 60% accuracy is not good for me at all. Or maybe you'll say that the application that I have, for example, predicting the result of a game or predicting, say, um, uh, non-disclosure in a tax form, something like being right two out of three times is good enough. Or maybe you want much better results, let's say 99.65%. Then more data, more precision. Some fields require a lot of precision, some fields do not. A little bit of an advantage over the competitor may be all that you need. For example, in financial markets, precision is set by the customer. The algorithm's job is to say, give me enough data and tell me how good you want me to be and I'll see if I can tune the algorithm to get there. It's a journey, 
But that's what these programs are all about, both the data and the algorithm. Questions again on mechanical engineering. Jigar asks, um, again, as I had explained, if you have used computers for any kind of algorithms, even say opening an Excel spreadsheet or running some kind of design software, et cetera, I don't think email counts, but anyway. So whatever it is, I think you can do this. You may need to be clever about certain things, such as finding the right application that makes sense to you. You may also need to work a little harder but once again, most of the people who are innovating in this field are not coming strictly from a computing background. Most Kaggle champions, grandmasters, are not necessarily computer science people. And it's a misconception to think that. Again, by definition, many of the people coming into this are from other quantitative areas, like, stati like statistics, for example. I am trained as a statistician and bring other skills to the table other than purely the computer programming aspect to this. So if you're good at your job, and let's say um, in mechanical engineering, maybe you'll come up with the next good mechanical design. Maybe you'll come up with the next um, intelligent system for, um, for say water dispersal on a field, precision agriculture, lots of interesting things where your domain will be interesting and your domain will be what will be needed. And a little bit of expertise, maybe by borrowing and stealing, from areas such as the cloud and collaborating with people in the right organization will get you there. I would absolutely not say to that. Hmm. Uh, Nitin asks, audacious non-engineers or non-mathematicians? I like the term audacious. Right? There is a certain audaciousness needed here. Um, what is needed prior to enrolling? Number one, passion and time. Hmm. The ability to, to, to go through this. Right. Give yourself a year, give yourself six months, depending on the program that you take. So set aside a certain amount of time, take a deep breath and say, I am ready for this journey. The other thing is to, is to begin to think in numerical terms, begin to think in data terms, see data in places, see where can data come from? What kind of algorithm is likely to work here? And that can be worked on even using information, for example, that I gave. So in some way, data or, or AI fi your thinking a little bit without knowing what that precisely means and get yourself in order. Details, yes. Sometimes details help. You know, knowing, for example, linear algebra might help or knowing a sorting algorithm might help. But I think if you have the passion, you can learn those and see those on the fly. As I said, Time, passion, and open eyes for data and the opportunity for algorithms. And so maybe um, one more question or a couple of questions. Uh, in terms of the technology, so Vansh asks, what is the best programming language and what can be used to learn this? So there are two kinds of answers to that. One is a, pro a language that is needed, a programming language that is needed to learn things. Uh, simple, good object-oriented languages like Python are very, very good at doing that, at teaching you how to learn. Now, there are other languages, for example, forms of databases, NoSQL, R, many of these are used in specialized cases, but straightforward object-oriented languages like Python or Java would probably be the place to start. On the other hand, if you've already had expertise in something like, say, C or C++, that is not to be laughed at. Many good applications, particularly applications that are built close to a device, have to have languages such as C built on it. Hmm. Um, but so the runtime environment of an AI ML algorithm depends on how it is run. IoT devices may be using C, etc. The learning environment or web applications may need Java-based techniques, whatever. But the run, learning environment tends to be Python and its variants libraries, which we follow in our programs. Wasn't the same a few years ago, may not be the same a few years from now, but that's where we are at this time. Uh, Jayadeep asks about quality assurance. Um, as someman who's a, a Six Sigma master black belt, I understand that question. Yes, 
If you are on the numerical side of quality assurance, in other words, working with data, uh, maintaining it with various testing environments in software or in manufacturing, then as I said, the quantitative bend of mind should be enough. But be clear on the applications that you have in mind. One possibility, and this applies to everyone who's on, uh, in on this call, is are you intending to go back to your application domain, to your original career? Be that mechanical engineering, be that architecture, be that quality assurance, in which case keep the application world open. The second option is to change careers fully and do something quite different. That's a harder journey, but your quantitative thinking should still be able to help. And so therefore, if you, if you come at this from the bend of saying, as a QA engineer, I understand the risks facing a company, maybe I can build applications of that kind. I myself, tend to, tend, having a past in quality, tend to look at things from a risk and defense perspective first, and then a growth and offense perspective. But that's just me. That's not, not what most people are. Tamak uh, Nas, in physics and chemistry, um, how can an experimental chemist use the program to face such a situation? It depends on what kind of experimental chemist you are. Hmm. Um, for example, many chemists are using this kind of um, technology to do high throughput screening, basically speed up the experimental process. Very important now. Let's say today, lots of chemists are working on, let's say COVID vaccines or COVID diagnostic tests. And there's so many possibilities to do that. We can't do all those experiments in the few months that we have as people around us die. So most of these experiments are done within AI or ML systems, digitizing the process and saying, if this is the experiment that I would do, what is the most likely result that I will get? And if that result is looks to be quite negative in probabilistic terms, then don't go in that direction. So making things high throughput, helping design molecules, for example, if that is the kind of thing that you do, getting structures, quantitative structure activity relations, QSAR, what many chemists do, in order to be able to use these kinds of intelligence to say, if my molecule looks like this, this is how the atoms are arranged, this is the property it will have. One of the things we teach is called supervised learning, where the response is something, fraud, take up, risk, it's a human behavior. Doesn't have to be a human behavior, it can be a molecule's behavior as well. We chose business as a prototype, but rest assured, High throughputting of science is a major, major business concern today with implications for all industries and of course our lives. Hmm. So if you are an experimental chemist and many experimental chemists are working in this field, adventure awaits. Okay, so I think um, keep the questions coming. I may not be able to get to it. Someone from the organization probably will. Uh, stay in touch, everyone. And I think I hope you enjoyed um, this session. Uh, I certainly love being here. Uh, I love being a part of the uh, AI ML programs in great learning. And I actively have created and participated in, in the AIFL program, uh, AI for Leaders program. Hope to see you there. Or if not, I hope to see you out there in the world, in your areas, or if you want a career shift, learning all these exciting things. Coding, no coding, don't let this pass you by. This is a world of big data and deep learning. We have no choice but to join in and let's have fun doing it along the way. Okay, thanks very much.